Hello, everybody, to this week's lecture of Stop 7829, Text Analysis in Corpus Linguistics. So what you're about to see is a lecture by um, Dr. Peter Crosthwaite, who is senior lecturer in our school and who is one of the world leading uh, specialists on DDL, data driven learning. And he'll give a talk about using corpora um, for language learning and teaching in the context of uh, DDL. So I hope you enjoy the rest of the lecture and yeah, see you soon in the tutorials. So uh, let's get into it today. And you can see here on this image, which came out from uh, a review, a bibliometric review with the field of corpus linguistics that I and, and Martin Schweinberger and a colleague published last year, um, all of the different things here that people are doing with corpora, um, whether that's um, looking at spoken discourse, whether that's metaphor, whether that's discourse analysis of the kind of work that Monica is well known for. Um, but in particular, I'd like to draw your attention to the little blue bubble over here, um, uh, DDL, which is the data-driven learning or the direct use of language corpora for language teaching and learning. And corpora have been widely used in education for decades now, whether you know it or not. Uh, if you've ever taken the IELTS test or done IELTS materials, for example, maybe you, you know this book here, the Mindset series, uh, which is, I was one of the authors of this series. Um, IELTS uh, corpora, learner corpora have been used for a long time to help uh, generate language tests, uh, syllabi, materials, uh, and then for uh, language research, of course. But what, I, what we're going to be talking about today is this intersection between corpora teachers and learners with that term, their data-driven learning, which was a term coined as far back as the early 90s by a pr professor called Tim Johns, uh, who was one of the first to use corpora for this purpose. So in terms of what data-driven learning is, it's classed as the direct, hands-on use of corpus linguistics in education. And I've got a couple of slides coming up that help to explain that a little bit further. But essentially, it's about combining typical corpus linguistic techniques like concordancing, keyword analysis, frequency list generation, holocuts, and so on, and combining these kind of, uh, this kind of information and these kind of corpus skills with teaching, with, ped with pedagogy, and with language learning. From a theoretical point of view, um, you can see here on the image, it essentially works in uh, two main ways. At the individual level, Students' corpus consultation is a kind of discovery learning following constructivist usage-based learning principles. And by this, we mean that under usage-based accounts of second language acquisition, for example, frequency and salience and constructions and multi-word units and chunks and all of these things are highly important for language learning. And the idea is that what corpora do very well is to make some of these, some of this frequency information more salient. Um, it provides evidence of uh, important factors like uh, what words go together with other words, what words don't go together, so that then um, you are inductively acquiring all of this information from the data that you're being exposed to. This is called focus on form for those of you who've taken courses in SLA uh, previously. From a classroom perspective, when students are consulting corpora together with the assistance of their peers or maybe with their teacher, this brings into account more social, um, socio-cultural, socio-constructivist forms of learning with uh, tiers, uh, teachers and peers um, mediating the corpus data, talking about what they're finding, reflecting upon what they're finding, and so on, and all of these things are helping people talk about language, and analyzing language to learn about language. Um, DDL has been used uh, for a wide range of different learning targets. For example, first language acquisition, second language acquisition, understanding uh, general and specific disciplinary genres, understanding different registers, 
and uh, disciplinary discourses. Um, for example, a lot of the work that I was doing in Hong Kong. So uh, that's a little bit about what it is. You can see here in this image some of the different uh, ideas in terms of how DDL might help you acquire vocabulary at the individual level by uh, consulting concordance lines from corpora, analyzing, synthesizing these results. Um, this leads to higher order thinking when conducted with teachers and in classroom settings, with teacher guided activities. We've got increased engagement in solving problems together with the scaffolding of inquiries with instructor support and all of these things together, uh, so the theory supposes, are meant to be beneficial for second language acquisition and uh, the results, um, the evidence of learning gains has been now widely uh, recognized in the kind of two decades or so of research with four uh, data driven learning studies that are now uh, widely reported in meta-analyses and bibliometric analyses uh, within the last few years. So how does it work exactly? Um, at the very basic level, um, learners' interaction with concordance data uh, as provided through corpora, learners will read concordances, they'll be able to understand how words are used in context, they'll be able to manipulate those concordances and sort and rearrange them to, um, to find different pathways into the targets that they're, that they're querying. Uh, and that's kind of the, the more traditional uh, method. As the corpus tools have increased in functionality, we now have the ability to generate uh, frequency lists, to understand collocation information at both the statistical and increasingly visual levels, as you might get here in the bottom left, where the, the user searching for all verbs that will come before the term death penalty. You can then see here some visual cues as to the, the potential likelihood of, uh, of, of a given verb filling that slot. And then you'll be able to make an informed decision about which one may be uh, the verb that you're supposed to use. Some more even advanced tools are uh, putting together visual kind of information. This one here is taken from the tool called Voyant Tools, which is a freely available kind of uh, self-built corpus viewer, uh, data and uh, data analyzer. Uh, so for people who maybe don't like reading concordances or maybe who find reading concordances too difficult, maybe there are uh, lower proficiencies, for example, this could be an alternative way into the data. So it's gone beyond simple concordancing Modern corpus tools have a lot of different powerful functions and data-driven learning researchers like myself are working hard to make sure that uh, different learners are exposed to as many different kinds of data as possible so that they can gain as many insights into that data that they can for the purposes of teaching and learning. So I mentioned before about direct DDL. Uh, there are two kinds of DDL in the literature. Firstly, the indirect DDL, which is use of corpora to generate uh, teaching materials, uh, exercises, maybe the sequencing of curricula and so on. And then these will find their way into textbooks. And most uh, modern publishers, like the big publishers, like Cambridge University Press, Oxford, Macmillan, Pearson, they have corpus linguists who work in the offices. Uh, they're there uh, getting the information about language at, say, different proficiency levels, different registers, different disciplines, and they're putting together uh, exercises and, and grammar tasks and vocabulary uh, learning tasks and many more, and putting these into uh, established textbooks so that for publication, for sale around the world. So you, you may have already been using corpus-based teaching materials for some time, without maybe necessarily realizing that you've done so. The direct form though, the one that we're really here to talk about today is learners using some kind of computer or mobile device to consult uh, a corpus or corpora with a particular corpus tool or tools for the purposes of teaching and learning, whether that's uh, at the individual level or here, as you can see in the image, maybe at the, in a classroom working together to solve language related tasks and problems. So uh, an example of a hands-on DDL activity may be to go to a popular corpus platform, 
for example, here, Corpus Mate, which I'll introduce to you later uh, in the talk. This is a, a tool that's uh, recently been released by myself and uh, Dr. Vit Beiser, who's also created a number of other popular Corpus tools that you might already know, like Scale, and he's worked on the Sketch Engine platform. Uh, using this tool, you might then go and search for particular nouns and then the, the prepositions that follow them. You will then look at the concordance lines or maybe take in some of the statistical information about these combinations uh, and search this data to find the patterns of these prepositional patterns together with these nouns. Uh, so, for example, here, blame, attention, delighted. And that would be an example of a hands on EDL activity. To juxtapose that, a uh, hands off activity would be where. Uh, the teacher prior to the class taking place uh, would actually go into the corpus and pull out these concordances by themselves. These could then be uh, copied and pasted onto uh, a Word document, printed out as a handout for the students to then look at together in a classroom setting. Um, this kinds of activity is usually used as a precursor to uh, direct hands-on DDL for, for learners who are just starting to learn about how to do this kind of learning, or also hands-off DDL is also uh, used in situations where students do not have access to computers or mobile devices within the classroom context. Uh, this is pretty common in uh, countries like Vietnam and Indonesia, where I do a lot of teacher training work, where the teachers are the only ones with the computer in that setting. And so they, they're the ones responsible for getting the teaching activities together. Uh, and then the students will do still do data driven learning, but without necessarily having access to the corpus on their own. So in terms of um, some of the questions you might have, uh, we've divided these up into, I think, three. And then we've kind of got an answer for uh, how um, for each of these in the slides that follow. So one of the first questions is about the potential challenges of using corpora and DDL in the classroom. Um, this um, includes finding appropriate corpora for consultation in that uh, the corpora should be suitable for the target uh, language or register or genre that you're attempting to learn. Um, understanding how to use corpus tools effectively and then developing activities and exercises that are engaging and effective for students. Um, not only that, but you also need to do a little bit of training in the process of consulting corpora and analyzing concordances and understanding frequency information, understanding collocate information, so that they know what that information tells us and, um, and how to learn about language using that information. In terms of my work, uh, I mean, I've done a lot of DDL work at the, the university level, but what the thing I'm probably more known for is trying to expand the scope of DDL studies beyond university education into primary and secondary classrooms. Uh, you can see here some of the main barriers to implementing DDL within these contexts. This might include a lack of pedagogic processing of existing adult focused materials as most corpus tools and corpus data are produced with adults in mind and therefore may be unsuitable for younger learners or learners sometimes in more conservative teaching and learning contexts like Indonesia, for example. Uh, we also mentioned there a lack of software. Uh, many of the tools available are produced um, for adults and produced for language researchers or applied linguists rather than language learners and their teachers. Uh, there are now some software that's emerged over the last five years that have made uh, great efforts to be more user-friendly, uh, and as well as my own tool, Corpus Mate, which I'll talk about in a moment. But uh, a lot of research is still done with very complex tools like a BYU or EnglishCorpora.org uh, with about 35% of DDL studies still using those uh, very complex tools. And then, of course, um, teachers don't, teachers need training, teachers need help in understanding what corpora are, what they can do, and how to use them. And this term has been called corpus literacy, 
And there's been uh, a great number of recent studies within the last couple of years focusing on using corpora in language teacher education, language teacher training at the pre-service levels and at the in-service levels. I'm busy doing one of these right now with language teachers in Vietnam. There's been a lot of work in Hong Kong. There's been work in Europe, um, as well as my own work here in Australia. And what we find for computer-assisted language learning in general, and corporate in particular, is that teachers generally have pretty good technological knowledge. They have pretty good pedagogical knowledge. They have very good content knowledge, but it's this combination of being able to put together a lesson plan that combines content knowledge, pedagog pedagogical knowledge, and technological knowledge into this middle part here known as TPAC. Um, and this is something that a lot of studies at the moment are trying to work out the best ways to promote this TPAC uh, using, for, you, for using corpora and DDL. Um, so this is something that is quite popular, and I've seen a number of studies on this come out within the last few months, for example. So another question you might have is, how do you ensure that your students are using corpora and DDL effectively? Um, one way is through tutorials and demonstrations and training. Uh, another way is to monitor their progress and provide feedback on their use of corpora. In particular, trying to get them to do it in pairs and groups so as to facilitate uh, that social cultural element to what it is that they're doing. And it makes it more fun for them as well to be able to talk about corpus data, to be able to talk about what they're looking at, what that data means to them, what they're getting out of that data. They can share ideas and strategies and so on. And then uh, to think about whether the activities and, uh, that you're doing with corpora are helping, to, helping you to ensure that you're meeting your learning objectives. So really useful ways to do this that have come out of the literature include the concepts of pattern hunting and pattern refining, which I'll talk about on the next few slides. And then uh, the four I's of illustration, interaction, induction, and intervention, again, which I'll, I'll also talk about in a moment. What you can see here on the right is also uh, with relation to second language writing studies, whereby uh, you will have um, students doing written work, teachers providing indirect feedback on that written work, and then students using corpora to, um, to revise um, the, uh, their, their writing based on the, uh, the written feedback that's provided. And I did a fair bit of research on what is the best way to, what is the best kind of feedback to give to students that's going to allow corpus consultation to occur. Um, and um, by, by working on multiple drafts and, and using corpora as a tool to help uh, revise errors and, and issues with readability and content, using corpora is a really effective way in the second language writing classroom. Uh, so that's something to think about there for those of you who are thinking of doing that. Pattern hunting uh, as a concept involves students searching for patterns in the corpus. These patterns could be in the form of collocations, maybe fixed phrases, grammatical structures, and so on. And using corpus data, maybe frequency data or collocation information, to help us understand that uh, the thing that I'm looking for or the information that I'm looking at in the data is a frequent pattern in English, that it is commonly used in this discipline or that discipline or that register or this register. For example, here, corpus analysis might reveal that the verb make is often used in collocation with the noun decision, i.e. make a decision, and then once students know that that is a pattern, they can then go ahead and search for instances of that pattern in corpus A or corpus B, and then um, explore that pattern in detail. Uh, and the, the hope is, but by querying that pattern and understanding how that pattern is used, they're then taking the necessary steps to acquire that pattern uh, as a fixed construct. Pattern refining then is taking that original pattern and extending that context maybe. Um, so once we've identified the pattern, we can then refine it and change it and seek alternatives to that pattern and see how those work. 
For example, if the pattern make a decision has been identified as useful, the teacher might provide examples about how it is used in a certain context and then provide exercises that allow students to practice using the pattern themselves. So once you've identified patterns, then playing around with the different situations of use, playing around with some of the different contexts or registers, playing around with the individual nouns or verbs in that con construction is, is termed pattern refining. And basically, uh, as long as you're doing one of these two uh, or both, then uh, you're getting students to really focus on form, uh, meaningful look at language, and uh, you're, you're creating the conditions for language acquisition to occur. In terms then of the four eyes I mentioned previously, we have here illustration in which the teacher is presenting examples from corpus data. Maybe this could be done at the beginning of a lesson or as a pre-lesson activity. The goal of this step is to provide students with a clear understanding of how a given expression, for example, is used in a real world situation. Following that, we get on to the interaction stage, maybe here. Following corpus consultation, we then take some of the patterns that we found, use these in communicative activities, whether that's speaking or writing, could be pair work, could be group work, whole class discussion, and so on providing students with opportunities to practice using the target language in a supportive and interactive environment. Then uh, we could go back to the corpus data, maybe that pattern refining stage. And uh, we're here at stage three, then induction. Students will analyze examples of language they've encountered in the previous steps. This might include identifying additional patterns, alternative collocations, alternative phrasal or grammatical structures, and then this is providing you with a deeper understanding of the things that you were looking for originally. And an optional final step would, that, would be that of intervention. Maybe here the teacher then is providing corrective feedback on oral production, on written production, uh, helping students to reflect on their language use, and helping them to develop accuracy and fluency in the use of the target language, whether that's with additional corpus evidence or not. So those are some practical ways that a teacher might be able to operationalize data-driven learning activities in the classroom. What examples do we have of how this can be done in, say, the context of a lesson plan? So some examples include uh, maybe language teaching materials like vocabulary lists, uh, listening and reading comprehension activities that use corpus data, writing prompts based on, uh, on language corpus data, um, using DDL software to help students identify and analyze patterns maybe in oral data, for example, or listening scripts, or from a reading passage that they've been given, maybe we could run that that data into a corpus tool and identify some of the most frequent vocabulary constructions and structures within that input text so that we can make some of those patterns more salient and more learnable and more teachable. So by way of example, something that um, I produced together with a team of researchers in Brazil at the State University of Sao Paulo, was uh, an open educational resource for using language data to learn about language. And uh, this is a teacher's guide to classroom corpus use. And basically you can access this uh, freely available on uh, the website using language data, which I'm just gonna put into the chat here for everybody. Um, and what this book contains is a set of ready-made lesson plans that all contain at least one corpus-based activity in pursuit of the lesson goals. So by way of example, I'm gonna take you through the second lesson in the book, So Many Things in a Day. The uh, lesson is designed for high school learners and it's help, aiming to help learners use colloquial expressions with the verbs be, get, have, put, and take in the context of daily or routine activities. Now, something that we do in this book, as I mentioned previously, was that for each lesson in this book, we've designed two alternatives to the lesson. One is the hands-on version, 
where the students are able to use corpora themselves uh, to complete the activities. And then the hands-off version where the students don't have access to the corpus, but maybe the teacher has access to the corpus or we provide the concordances uh, them, uh, ourselves so that students can go ahead and complete the lesson. Each lesson comes with a YouTube video that guides learners through the technical process of querying the corpus uh, for those who respond better to, uh, to video presentation rather than in text. Some information about the teacher who provided it. So let's go into the lesson. Uh, we, we've got an image here of each lesson plan that summarizes the lesson into a single handy image that can be printed out. The objectives are to use these verbs in daily activities or routine contexts. We have here the specific objectives. This includes using the scale corpus platform to look for possible combinations with these ver target verbs and then use that data to help write sentences that describe people's daily routines. Then in terms of lesson development, each lesson takes a step-by-step -step, uh, guide from introduction, um, talking about the context of the, of the lesson, the prior knowledge that may be required before we get into the corpus consultation, the actual development, uh, the corpus research component of the lesson, uh, the, including the amount of time that that's going to take, uh, the nature of the interaction, so that's going to be teacher to learners or learners to learners, application of the corpus data, and then some kind of closing uh, reflection, discussion about what they found, uh, and in some cases uh, also an optional uh, assessment component as well for teachers who may need that. We then get into the specific activities, including uh, the, the pre-warm-up activities, like here in small groups, talk about your daily routine, answer the questions below. Another um, awareness-raising activity of the verbs uh, that we're interested in here, uh, be, get, have, put, and take. And then the actual corpus activity here, students have to go to the scale corpus, which should open up in another uh, tab. This is here the scale platform. It's called the Sketch Engine for Language Learning platform, which is a really simple, very user friendly corpus query platform based on the Sketch Engine uh, software. Students are then looking for possible combinations involving the words be, get, have, put, and take using the word sketch function. So, for example, if we put here get, I'm going to look at get uh, examples of get. Scale will give me 40 of these. So I've got uh, here gets used, gotten too expensive, got immediate attention, getting worse, getting sloppy, and so on. Or I could use the word sketch function and look up some information about the subject of get, so nouns that come up as a subject of get. For example, things get, people get, kids get, players get. Or uh, nouns that are the object of get, get a job, uh, get the idea, get results, and so on. And these are all clickable, and I can then go ahead and find uh, those sentences and results. And then the students will be uh, using, uh, inputting some of the, the information they found there into those functions. Uh, when that's all done, they will write sentences using those combinations that they found, and then they'll discuss the following questions with their classmates as a reflective activity. The hands-off version of the lesson uh, does basically exactly the same thing, but this time, instead of getting the students to consult the corpus, uh, we've given the students the concordances themselves, and they can use this information then to be able to complete the activities uh, without necessarily having access to the, the corpus data uh, or the access to the corpus platform on their own. So that's pretty much about how that works and how you might put together a sample DDL lesson and again, do go ahead and check out that book anytime. There are 16 useful lessons that you can modify for your own context. In terms of the next question then, uh, questions you might have, how can I assess my students' progress in using corporate and DDL? Uh, this can be done experimentally, uh, can be done in the form of assessments. Uh, we can introduce questions related to corpus consultation or data-driven learning on your students' assessments or exams in order to test your students' understanding of these tools 
and of the language that it is that they're going to be querying. So one example of what kind of experimental study that I did over the last couple of years was work uh, published in Computer Assisted Language Learning last year with, um, with secondary age uh, students at an all girls school here in uh, Queensland. And I did kind of data driven learning workshop for all staff at the school. Uh, it kind of in the hope that somebody would want to work with me and to do some experimenting. And I, I, I was contacted by the teachers of um, the English as an additional language and dialect, uh, as well as the physical science teachers who noticed that their students, uh, when writing research reports, which is uh, one of the things that they have to do for their high school examinations in year 12, um, they write research reports without necessarily understanding the use of the passive voice very well. And these are largely monolingual English speaking students. Um, um, and they're still not really able to understand the context of when they might use the passive voice and also how to put it together properly, frequently making errors when doing so. So they thought using corpora might be a really good way to help raise students' awareness about the passive voice construction in science report writing. So how did it work? What did we do? The students were writing research reports about science experiments that they were observing in class. Uh, this include the effect of static electric charge against deflection, which you can see here in the image in the top right, whereby um, the students are, they get like a metal um, pole, they have to rub it with a, a cloth this generates static electricity on the pole. They then turn on the tap and the water will deflect around the static electricity. And then once they've observed that experiment and taken notes, they then have to write that up as a research report. They also had to do this for two other experiments, including uh, wire resistivity and the uh, concentration of uh, substances. Uh, so more on the chemical side of things there. Based on their early drafts of these research reports, I, I built a learner corpus uh, based on this and looked at the kind of uh, passive voice constructions that they were having trouble with. And the most frequently used verbs in passive voice included uh, is and was, obviously, and were, but uh, also uh, rubbed, rubbing, applied, moved, measured, and charged. So on the basis of these targets, then, I put together uh, as additional activities on my course, improving uh, writing through corpora, which I believe that many of you are now doing as part of your assessment for this course. Uh, you're doing the, the activities designed for the university students. But what you'll see uh, at the bottom of that are the activities that I designed uh, for the training for the uh, for the secondary school students, so it's here the Ipswich Girls Physical Science Corpus activities, and you can see here some of the um, online materials that students did in class together with their teachers that would take them through some uh, the use of pretty straightforward corpus tours and try to get them to learn about these verbs in passive voice construction. So. For example, here, this activity is using the lingual platform, using the or operator, uh, which is operationalized by a forward slash here. This then tells you which word either side of the slash is the more frequent in the corpus. So for example, here, is it was charged is more frequent or is it more was electrified uh, is the more frequent. Entering this search into lingual will give you the following results. And then you can make a reasonable assumption about which word is the one I'm supposed to be using here. And then we give them another activity using a different set of verbs. They go into the corpus and then they enter the multiple choice questions here. There were five modules that took them through the basic functions of these different uh, corpus tools. And upon completing all of this training in class, we then attempted to assess whether their they improved in their knowledge and use of the passive voice uh, as a result of this corpus consultation. So what did we find? 
we found that uh, at the receptive levels, uh, we gave them two experimental procedures. One was a grammaticality judgment task sourced from the IRIS repository. Uh, so they would get sentences, for example, here, rice has been grown for thousands of years. They have to label whether this expression is correct, incorrect, or not sure. Um, and then we gave them this test at the beginning of the training and uh, immediately following completion of the five modules of training as well. Now, at the receptive levels, you have to remember that these are mainly monolingual speakers of English. So they already know and understand the passive voice construction, which is why we did not get a significant difference in the test scores with, between uh, the pre-test and the post-test. But we didn't really expect to because we knew that they would already have quite good um, knowledge of the passive voice construction. However, something we did do for the post test was that we said, if you want to use a corpus platform to check your answer, then you can. And uh, students would select yes or no about whether they use the corpus uh, tool to, uh, to check their answer. And we found that they actually did so quite frequently. Uh, they did. They used Corpora as a collective 168 times uh, from a group of about 40 students. And we also noted that when they did use the corpus, 87.5% uh, of um, answers that had that were associated with corpus use resulted in a correct answer. That's something that we were quite positive about. So even though uh, the difference was not significant in terms of the pre and post test scores, Students were freely using Corpora and doing so fairly accurately. The second task we gave them was an error correction task. Uh, we got a sentence with an error in it. Students have to rewrite the sentence uh, correcting the error. Again, this is a receptive task, so they didn't really um, do any better pre or post test. But again, that when they were given the, the opportunity to use a corpora, they did so fairly frequently, and most of the time they did so accurately as well. Quite surprising was in the productive task, where you could see here they have to follow a picture sequence of putting these verbs in passive voice. For example, here the package was taken to the post office, the package was weighed on the scales, the package was stamped, and so on. We found that girls uh, did significantly better on the post-test than they did in the pre-test. Uh, and they were also uh, used the corpora to check their intuitions fairly frequently and did so um, with a high degree of accuracy as well. So we can see here that um, for a number of the learners, um, the, the training that they had with corpora had potentially helped uh, boost their uh, production abilities for the passive voice construction. We also um, gave them uh, the opportunity to use corpora in free writing practice as well. So not just using experimental procedures. Uh, the students would write their reports, or in this case, their, their essays. This is from a different class group. Um, I would provide some written corrective feedback using yellow highlight for maybe expressions that could reasonably be solved using corpus consultation. The students then revised their writing based on that feedback and used color coding to indicate what tool they've used. So they had the option of using any tool they liked. So that's including corpus tools and non-corpus tools. So they could use Google, they could use the Google Translate, they could use a dictionary, or they could use um, Lingles, corpus tools, scale, or so on. And what we found was that uh, in the science reports, students used a range of tools to revise. Uh, issues with their science report writing, including Google or dictionary.com and so on, Google Translate. But we also found that the students did use corpus tools quite frequently, in fact, more frequently than they were using the other tools. And we see a high degree of accuracy with the corpus consultations taken. In particular, students uh, were using the corpora to correct passive voice constructions quite frequently as compared with. Um, Google or dictionary.com, and they did so with a very high degree of accuracy as well. So quite encouraging results there. However, in the follow-up, and this is something that we get often in DDL studies, 
whereby uh, a well-meaning applied linguist like myself comes into a school context, says, you know, hey, I've got this wonderful tool that's going to solve some of your language problems. And then a few months later, we interview the students, give them a survey. Hey, are you still using Corpus tools? And unfortunately, not many are continuing to do so. Only four out of the original group reported that they were still doing them. Uh, and they were using uh, Lingle primarily for reasons that I'll explain in a moment. You can see here uh, students' reasons for discontinuing corpus use, mainly revolving around not knowing how to use the tool properly or going back to their preferred ways of finding linguistic information, for example, in Google. Difficulties understanding concordance results and the complexity of corpus output is also seen as a big turnoff uh, and so on. So lots of different reasons here for discontinuing corpus use. And these are kind of replicated in a lot of DDL studies, not just for younger learners, but also for adults as well uh, in various settings. So in terms of the interview and survey data that we gave, they had generally quite positive perceptions about using corporate and DDL. Um, they prefer to use the simplest and fastest tools available. They like to make comparisons of different query results, but they like to have this in one place instead of having to click various functions as you have to do with a number of popular corpus tools, maybe like Sketch Engine, for example, where you'll search for a given term and then you have to click the frequency button and then you have to click the collocation button and it's a real pain to use. Um, they also liked different forms of information, so not just concordances, but they like visual comparative charts, they like statistical information, but they also found disciplinary specificity particularly important. So tools like Scale or Lingle don't let you to don't allow you to limit searches by genre or discipline. The, the full sketch engine tool does allow you to do that, and they still found that as incredibly useful, even though they frequently complained about the complexity of the sketch engine platform in general. So um, based on this feedback, we decided to produce a new purpose-built corpus tool, and that's introduced to you here, uh, Corpus Mate. So I don't have much time left to go through the main functions, but I will just kind of provide a brief overview. It's got a number of different corpora uh, spanning 50 million words, almost roughly divided between written data and spoken data. This spans 20 different subject areas, including science, history, technology. And when you conduct a search, you can filter for these different topics. Uh, so one of the things that um, oh, sorry, these are the different corpora that we use. So we have here the simple Wikipedia corpora, British Academic Corpus of Written English, TED Talk corpus, Elsevier uh, Science Text corpus, the British National Corpus of Spoken Data, and the BBC Teach uh, corpus data as well for just over 50 million words with um, a fairly uh, decent range of documents and tokens over the 20 different topic areas within the corpus data. In terms of the search options, we have only three operators, so no kind of complex corpus query language, uh, no use of regular expressions and things like that. We wanted to keep it as simple as possible. Students have the option of searching for individual words or, or phrases. They have uh, the wildcard symbol uh, used uh, with a uh, operated with a star, a question mark, which lets you check for zero or one occurrence of the previous word. So do I need this word in this expression? I can put a question mark on that word and see if I need that or not. And then the or operator, uh, which is operationalized with a slash. So is it uh, in the small or is it as small? And it will give you the information there uh, based on that. One of the uh, really cool things that uh, it does, and which has also been replicated in the latest version of AntConc, is um, in terms of the concordances themselves are um, organized, not in terms of alphabetical order, uh, of the uh, preceding context, which is what you get in most corpus tools, but something that Ancom's done recently and that we've replicated here is to organize the results by the frequency of the four grams. So here, the, uh, the, 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 the most frequent four-word combination 
with this search term here, assess is displayed at the top. But in order to prevent uh, results, very frequent results dominating the page, we've also developed a tool whereby uh, only one example or is given. And then you can click here on the right and that will open up then the rest of the results. So you can see here that assess the impact of is an incredibly frequent um, construction in this corpus. And I can then uh, hide that as well and get to the second one here, assess the effect of, and so on. All of these are clickable. It gives some information about the source of the data, the topics that are covered. You can get the citation from Google Scholar, and you can be also be taken to Google Translate to see some sort of the translation of this as well. In particular, seeing the source is something quite advantageous at the moment as we live in the chat GPT era, where you don't know what the data is that uh, there is underlying some of the, the sentences that you're getting out of that. We can also switch to sentence view. This uh, allows you to see your search terms in a sentence format, and you can expand the context now for the first time of the, um, the, co of, of the concordance with uh, adding one sentence before and one sentence after. And you can do this as many as four times. So if you really want to see the context that, that the search term for a given concordance is generated, you can click that expand button and it will give you as much information as possible. The compare results function works similarly to Lingual, whereby you get a visual display of the different lemmas in this case. Or if I want to use a wildcard search, I might then use uh, be able to see visually uh, the percentage uh, frequency of, of, of a given shot. Um, there from, from that search term, or the pattern finder tool will give me the most frequent foregrounds, but this time in the tab table form, limited to the top 20 hits together with its count from the corpus. These then are clickable and will take you straight to the concordance. And then we might also uh, want to look at the distribution by topic, um, looking at the discipline specificity of a given term, for example, assessment, uh, we're still yet to normalize this frequency. That's something that BIT is working on at the moment. So probably a little bit unreliable right now, but by the end of the week, that should all be fixed up nicely. So I think I've pretty much reached the end of the time here. I'm just going to jump ahead to the last few slides. Um, so we're currently using the Corpus Bay Platform for Language Teacher tra Training courses in Vietnam. Teachers are currently building lesson plans using these tools, including Corpus Mate. Uh, we're going to publish this in a special issue of assessing corpus literacy for an upcoming uh, special issue of TESOL quarterly. Uh, not only that, but we've also got here the uh, seminar series, which contain uh, a lot of information about uh, 30 different speakers on uh, all talking about the topic of DDL. Uh, you can access this YouTube playlist by following the link that I've just posted here in the chat. Again, uh, there are 30 different talks here with some of the world leading experts in this field, including Lawrence Anthony, Reiko Jablonghai, Anne O'Keefe, Paul Larson, and so on. So do, if you want more information about this topic and about this field, do go ahead and uh, check that out uh, for those of you who are interested.